Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your genes. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, George Papu talks about innovating with microalgae. And Noel Hanna explores the physics of the voice. But first up is the news. People suffering chronic fatigue syndrome have faulty immune systems. To which those people say, no kidding. The National Centre for Neuroimmunology and Emerging Diseases at Queensland's Griffith University have discovered a faulty receptor in the natural killer cells of the immune systems of people suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome. Griffith University is one of the few Australian institutions that includes people with severe chronic fatigue syndrome in their research, making home visits to collect samples. Severely ill patients have been left out of most studies, distorting the research results. In 1994, Keiji Fukuda from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta led a team that published the paper The Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, a Comprehensive Approach to Its Definition and Study, International Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Study Group. The diagnostic criteria of chronic fatigue syndrome in the paper has been adopted worldwide. The team's criteria for diagnosis include symptoms such as substantial impairment in short-term memory or concentration, sore throat, muscle pain, joint pain, headaches, unrefreshing sleep, and post-exertional exhaustion lasting more than 24 hours. People suffering chronic fatigue syndrome are often highly susceptible to infections. Calcium ions have a very high concentration difference across the cellular membrane and play a very important role in cell processes. The main effect of calcium signals on neurons is to change their electrical activity by opening and closing the sodium and potassium ion channels, which changes the signals that the neurons transmit. Calcium ions also affect the regulation of metabolic activity, regulation of cell growth, changing the efficiency of connections between neurons, and sometimes the destruction of neurons. In the human immune system, Transient receptor potential melastatin subfamily 3 is expressed more often or upregulated when the body is threatened by infection, trauma, childbirth, or even environmental chemicals like perfumes. When working correctly, this receptor modulates an ion channel that transfers calcium from outside the cell to the inside. Faulty transport of calcium into cells in people suffering chronic fatigue syndrome can cause them pain in their brain and spinal cord, pancreas, and stomach. Calcium is required for normal functioning in every cell of the body. 15 people meeting Fukada's 1994 criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome were studied against 25 controls. The people with chronic fatigue syndrome had much lower levels of the receptor and much higher concentrations of calcium flowing into their cells than healthy people. There already exists a range of drugs that can change the way ion channels work, giving researchers a start in finding an effective treatment for the disease. Hopefully, because existing ion channel drugs for other diseases have already been tested for safety, there may be less of a wait until the drugs qualify for clinical trials. Higher levels of calcium flowing into cells, along with lower levels of transient receptor potential melastatin subfamily 3, suggest that part of chronic fatigue syndrome pathology is from these immune receptors not regulating the flow of calcium into cells in a healthy way, causing havoc in every cell of the body. Drugs already on the market for other calcium ion channel based illnesses will now be investigated for effectiveness in testing people with chronic fatigue syndrome. The Queensland State Government estimates the cost to the Australian community of chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis, treatment and management is more than $700 million every year. There are estimated to be around 250,000 Australians diagnosed with the illness. Griffith University have patented a blood test for genetic markers of chronic fatigue syndrome and Deakin University announced last year a blood test for immune response biomarkers to diagnose the disease. The study, 
Impaired calcium mobilization in natural killer cells from chronic fatigue syndrome myalgic encephalomyelitis patients is associated with transient receptor potential melastatin-3 ion channels, was published in Clinical Experimental Immunology. People with chronic fatigue syndrome have less energy. To which those people say, no kidding. A team at Håkerland University Hospital in Bergen, Norway, are investigating the theory that people with chronic fatigue syndrome are mainly getting their energy from fat and amino acids, which give much less energy than the sugar everyone else uses. This may account for fatigue and exhaustion. The process of turning fat and amino acids into energy also produces lactate as a waste product, and this causes muscle and joint pain. Complementary work at the University of San Diego found a depletion in fatty acids in people suffering chronic fatigue syndrome, which suggests the fatty acids were being used by their bodies for fuel. The Hawkeland University Hospital team studied amino acids in 200 people diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and 102 people who were healthy. In some of the women with chronic fatigue syndrome, the levels of amino acids used to make energy were lower than the healthy controls. However, this wasn't seen in men. This may be because women tend to take amino acids for energy from their blood, while men tend to take amino acids for energy from their muscles. The team did find higher levels of another amino acid byproduct that's an indicator that men with chronic fatigue syndrome were using amino acids from their muscles for energy. Both sexes had high levels of several enzymes known to suppress pyruvate dihydrogenase an enzyme essential for moving carbohydrates and sugars into a cell's mitochondria, a key step for exploiting sugar for energy. It's as if something is switching people over from burning sugar and carbohydrates to burning fats and amino acids for fuel instead, as if they were starving. The researchers suspect that an infection could cause the immune system to flick that metabolic switch from carbohydrates to amino acids. I reported last month how the same team were researching the cancer drug Rimuxitab as a treatment for chronic fatigue syndrome. They'd found that wiping out a type of white blood cell called B cells in chronic fatigue syndrome patients seemed to relieve the condition. These white blood cells make antibodies, and the researchers suspect that some antibodies made to combat infections may also recognise something in the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme and disable it leading to the switch from carbohydrate to amino acid energy metabolism. So the lack of certain amino acids in women with chronic fatigue syndrome and the presence of another amino acid in men with chronic fatigue syndrome, together with lower levels of the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase, strongly suggests that they're using fatty acids and amino acids for fuel instead of carbohydrates. And, as a consequence, they suffer from low energy, exhaustion and pain. Finding how the immune system is attacking pyruvate dehydrogenase and stopping it may switch people back to a carbohydrate metabolism that gives them normal energy levels and removes their pain. Their paper was titled Metabolic Profiling Indicates Impaired Pyruvate Dehydrogenase Function in Myalgic Encephalopathy Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and was published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation Insight. You're listening to Ian Wolf on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Noel Hanna works in the acoustics lab in the School of Physics at the University of New South Wales, where he researches The Voice. I visited his lab and began by asking him, we produce our voice with our vocal cords, But what are they? So the name vocal cords is almost a little bit of a historical misnomer. So it came about by an anatomist called Antoine Ferrin, who had a look at at these little strips of flesh in the voice box, and he imagined that they were something like the strings on a harpsichord or the strings on a, a violin. And so he used the word chords in French, which is basically string, to describe them. So... From then onwards, that's been a bit of a point of contention. Some people call them vocal cords, some people call them vocal folds. But essentially, they're little flaps of flesh, 
that vibrate in the airflow from the lungs. And that's what gives us the source of the voice, the, the very start of a voice. If you're to listen to vocal cords vibrating by themselves, not something that most people are able to do, it doesn't sound like a voice. It doesn't sound like a voice? So what does it sound like? It sounds something like a, a, a buzzing, a bit like a, a trumpet player if they're to play just into the, the mouthpiece of their, of their trumpet. It's a very harsh sound. The reason for that is when, if you're to think of sound waves, most people think of perhaps a sinusoidal wave from, from high school. This is this very smooth wave and it operates at one frequency. When you get two lumps of flesh and you bang them together, which is, which is what's happening when the vocal folds are vibrating, you, you no longer get a smooth sine wave, you, you get a wave that's, that's truncated. Essentially, it has some sharp points throughout the cycle. And so what that means is it's made up of lots and lots of frequencies. And so you have the fundamental frequency of oscillation. You have two times that frequency, three times, four times, etc. And so if you're to listen to that by itself, it's, it's this sort of buzzing sound. It's only when you add a vocal tract, so that's basically the airway between your vocal folds and your lips or your nose, that moderates that sound and it, it attenuates some frequencies, so it dampens some frequencies and it allows other ones to, to shine through. And it's those ones that shine through that, that then define the vowel sounds that we hear. So those are something we call formants in, uh, in speech and linguistics research. So your throat and your mouth and everything around there sort of shapes the sound. Exactly. So if you think about what you have control of while you're speaking, all of the different sounds of the language that you have, they're more or less defined by positions of your tongue, of your lips, the soft palate, that's the, the, the doorway between your nasal tract and your, your vocal tract. So by moving all of these things in a particular way, you define the sounds of a language. So what's happening when our voice becomes hoarse? So when our, our voice becomes hoarse, it tends to be things like when we get a cold or something like that. There's a, a variety of things that can essentially affect how the vocal folds operate. So it could be that they become inflamed and you, we're essentially adding mass to the, the vocal folds when they're vibrating. Or it could be that we're feeling tension somewhere else in the larynx and then we no longer operate the muscles in the same way. And so that's one of the effects. And we have false vocal cords or vocal folds. What do they do? That's a, yes, a very interesting question. So the, the false vocal folds or the aryepiglottic folds sit just above the vocal folds. And for most people, they don't do a lot. In, in general speech, we don't tend to use them. What they they essentially can have two functions. So they, they form part of the larynx just above the vocal folds, an area we can call the, the epilarynx or something like that, so just meaning above the top part of the larynx. And so one thing they can do is in singing, they can come together with that top part of the larynx to, to create a very narrow aperture, and that gives a, a strong resonance around about 3,000 hertz, which is something called the singer's formant or at least that's the, the idea behind that, that method. So that's something that operatic singers use to be heard above the orchestra. Different singers, for example, those singing certain styles of, of metal music and uh, Tibetan monks, they use the false vocal folds to vibrate much like the true vocal folds. So using those, you can either operate them independently, if you learn how, or at the same time as the vocal folds. And so you can get a... a phenomenon called period doubling where you get the two sets of vocal folds operating and you essentially lower the frequency by a half or you double the period of the cycle which is why it's called period doubling. I guess the other thing you can do to modulate sounds is almost like whistling while you're humming. Is that the sort of thing that happens with throat singing? It's I suppose similar in some ways but it, but different in others so certainly you can whistle while you while you hum or while you sing essentially so that means your vocal folds are, are working as in uh, as they would when you're normally singing you're whistling which means you're you're bringing your lips close together and you're creating a small aperture there that the air can f flow through very quickly and create a, a high-pitched whistling sound 
the whistle sound itself is governed by the, the second resonance of the vocal tract. So it, it's related to the volume of air inside your vocal tract, particularly that at the front where your, your tongue and, and I guess what you would call your mouth is. Um, you can also use that resonance or the lower one for um, harmonic singing or, or the throat singing that people are, are familiar with. In that sense, there's only one source so maybe to clarify that, if you're whistling and humming at the same time, you've got two, so two sound sources. You have your vocal folds vibrating, giving you one source, and you have the, the whistle operating at the lips, giving you another source. In harmonic singing, you just use the single source at your vocal folds, and what you do is you exaggerate the resonance of the tract at a high frequency that you want to show off. And so by doing that, you can create a sound that sounds a bit like a whistle. It's in the same frequency range, but it's actually what you're doing is you're deadening all of the other frequencies of the voice and you're just emphasizing this one that's coming all the way through from your vocal folds through to your mouth. And what's your area of research? What's the unknown parts that you're looking into for the voice? So there are still quite a few active areas that I'm interested in. So one thing I've focused on is really accurately measuring the resonances of the vocal tract. So I'm interested in how much energy do you lose between the the vibration at the vocal folds and the mouth. So that comes comes in in two ways. One is is purely acoustically. It broadens the set of frequencies that that are shown off, uh, like the, in the throat singing example. And the other way that it comes in is at low frequencies, we also have a mechanical vibration of the, the vocal tract stimulated by the, the low frequency sound. So what that means is around about 20 hertz, we have the, the mass of the, the cheeks, the throat and, and all of the tissue around there actually being stimulated by the sound and, and vibrating itself. Now, this isn't something we usually stimulate because we tend to speak at 100 hertz or above but it's something that we use in plosives. So when we're starting a sentence with a P or a B, we have a little bit of time to build up some pressure inside our mouths, stretch our cheeks out, and really use that spring of the, of the cheeks and the rest of the vocal tract to give us an extra boost to the sound at low frequencies. And there's a lot of computer analysis of voice these days. Do they really have that good a model to understand what they're doing? So that's a good question. If you look at the sort of history of speech synthesis, they've started off from, from the sort of first principles of using the source of the voice and then using the filter. And early work at places like Bell Labs really used this method. But it, essentially it's moved on since then. So the companies that use synthetic voices now and speech recognition now tend to rely on a big data approach for using that. So they can essentially train models where they have a, a text and a speech and they can sort of put put it into a, a black box or, or something like a neural network that then is trained to look for the, the patterns between the two. And in that way, because they have so much data to train the system, you can end up with a very good synthetic speech without necessarily understanding the underlying physics. So the understanding is still to come. Unfortunately, yes, it's a, a bit of an embarrassment that since the the voice is essential to to all of human culture, that really it's not very well understood. We we still have this first order understanding of the the basics of how it works, what I've explained to you so far, but really the details are still not there. We don't really understand what is a, a normally functioning voice, and if we want to do things like help people with voice pathologies, try and diagnose pathologies, try and treat things, or even help people speak more clearly, help people learn languages, help people to sing better. We really need to improve our understanding of the, of the basics. Well, Noel Hanna, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. That was Dr Noel Hanna from the University of New South Wales talking about his research into voice. Noel was a member of the Diffusion team back in 2005. You can still find his old stories on the Diffusion archive. And finally, George Papu manages the Deep Green Biotech Hub at the University of Technology, Sydney. He gave a talk to the Sydney Biohackers at the Biofoundry about industrial uses for algae. 
I caught up with him after his talk and began by asking him what has he been doing at the Deep Green Biotech Hub. What I am doing, or what we're working on at UTS and the Deep Green Biotech Hub, is industrial applications for microalgae, which are single cell photosynthesizing organisms. So they, they take in CO2 and either sunlight or electric light and convert that into lots and lots of biomass, very efficiently converting it into biomass because they're single cells floating around in fluid, don't have to make structures like plants do. And what that means is they're a much more efficient way of producing organic matter. This has all sorts of applications from the very low cost like biofuels, which don't quite stack up economically, all the way up to very, very high value things like pharmaceutical manufacturing and other medicinal products. The area that we're focusing on over the next year is the mid-range, the, the mid-range products, things like food, food ingredients, um, pigments that can be produced at a reasonably low cost but have a reasonably high value. So you're sort of combining the, the best of the worlds of plants, of what you can grow from plants and what you can grow from microorganisms. That's right. So intuitively, algae kind of fits between those two worlds. It's a single cell, it doesn't have structural components. The ones we're working on are photosynthetic, so they do draw their energy from light. So they have the advantages of both of those systems. They're very efficient at converting energy to biomass. That energy comes from light as well, so it's a, a very sustainable way if you're using sunlight and if you're using a low energy production system, it's a very sustainable way of producing that biomass. And how do you find useful types of algae? So. Most wild strains come from a process called bioprospecting, where you go out into wild water environments, so streams, lakes, rivers, take a sample of water and then start to culture algae, single strains of algae out of that. Once you have that single strain, you can start to characterize it. it. Does it have the photosynthetic properties? Does it produce the products? When you're looking for most forms of algae, what you can do is you can go to wild water streams like uh, lakes, uh, rivers or creeks, take a sample of water and then using a petri dish with nitrogen and phosphorus in it, you can grow those algae into single colonies and then create pure cultures with just one type of algae in it and then start to look for useful properties. So if you're looking for an algae which expresses a certain protein or has a certain small molecule or has a certain colouring, you can find many wild strains and then start to look through those strains and characterise for the property that you're looking for. So you characterise by having them thrive under those conditions? Yep, that's exactly right. So you grow a single thriving culture and then you can start to screen for a particular property. When you say you put some nitrogen and phosphorus, so you're basically putting in some fertiliser? That's right. So a lot of the a lot of the recipes you can find for this sort of thing, and there's a lot online freely available. They use a standard rich rich plant fertilizer diluted down, and then either put into an agar or put into uh, reasonably pure water as a way of providing those trace minerals and trace nutrient sources for that microalgae. Or they draw their energy from light, but they still need some nitrogen, phosphorus, trace metals available in that media in order to thrive. And so what sort of uses are they put to at the moment? There's a few industrial uses. They are used for things like food colouring pigments. The blue colour in M&Ms, for instance, is produced from a spirulina product. They're also used in some other food applications. So if you walk into a health food store and look at the uh, green food section, you'll see names like spirulina, chlorella and astaxanthin. All of those are algal strains and they pretty much dry them out, pack them down into pills. Outside of that, there's a lot of other potential applications which are either at early stage commercialization or they're not yet viable. So there's things like oil? Biofuels have been a big one, or algal biofuels have been a big topic of conversation for the last couple of decades. There's been a lot of promise about a algal biofuels as a sustainable alternative to fossil fuels. At this stage, there's very few operations at a commercial scale and, very, uh, and as far as I'm aware, there's none that are, uh, are, are profitable. Last estimate I heard it was around $150, 150 Australian dollars per barrel for algal biofuels compared to I think about $50 for fossil fuels. So maybe medicinal uses might be more important? Medicinal uses are something which is definitely being explored both in native species that already have an extractable property and also in ones which have been genetically modified to express a useful medicine. There's a number of products on the market 
that I'm aware of that have been directly derived from a native, unmodified algal strain. What's the exciting thing that's happening in the world of algae at the moment? What's got you excited? The part that gets me really interested at the moment is the potential for very, very low resource food ingredients. So to give you a rough idea of how efficient algae is at using water, to create one tonne of protein out of beef, you need around 21,000 megalitres of water. So one tonne of beef protein requires 21 million kilolitres of water. I think that's right. It requires a lot of water. Algae requires 25 megalitres of water, a tiny fraction of the water that beef requires for that sort of protein. So there's new products emerging now, algal flowers, protein-rich flowers, and other algal food ingredients that have the potential to be a very low impact way of, of, of accessing protein enrichment for foods. And those small products and often undetectable by consumers have the potential for an enormous and positive environmental impact. Are there businesses in Australia that are working on this or is it only the universities? There's a few businesses popping up, there's a few startups, there's a couple of companies around. There's a lot more happening in the US and there's a lot more happening in Europe at the moment. But there's certainly a small and growing industry in Australia, but there's certainly a lot more opportunity for new businesses to enter. Well, George, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a pleasure. That was George Papu, manager of the Deep Green Biotech Hub at the University of Technology, Sydney, funded under the New South Wales Government Boosting Business Programme. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? Go to the website and click on the tab on the right to send a voicemail to be played on air. We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Support the show at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod at incompetech.com. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 27 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio.